So let's look at statins, folks. But just before we do, if you look in the show notes at my images that I've captured from the internet, look at the platelet activation, the platelet activation schematic. It's on page five of the notes. And you will understand what the real issue is with cardiovascular disease, with acquired cardiovascular disease. But now let's talk about statins. And in order to talk about statins, we have to know one simple fact, okay? And this is on page um, six at the bottom of my notes. So if you look at what statins do, there's a variety of lipid-lowering agents. And what statins do is, number one, the most common statins inhibit an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. And HMG-CoA reductase is in the cholesterol formation, the top of the cholesterol formation pathway. And what it does is it blocks, it blocks the formation of cholesterol. That's its primary indication. That's what it was developed for. Now, there are other, um, other molecules that we use as drugs that do a couple of other things in the liver cell. So, for example, niacin, which was one of the early lipid-lowering precursors. So, when the liver, under the influence of insulin, under the influence of, of uh, T3 thyroid hormone, under the influence of testosterone human growth hormone, when the liver produces cholesterol, well, it's producing cholesterol for a positive purpose for the brain and for the other cells, be that as it may. When the liver produces cholesterol, it has to be transported to the fat cells. And the molecule that transports the, liver, the cholesterol and the fat, the triglycerides, from the liver to the fat cells is a molecule called VLDL, or very low density LDL, produced by the liver uh, during meals and shortly after meals under the influence of insulin. And there's, a, there's a, another lipid-lowering drug called niacin, which is the one that I was put on 25 years ago that really caused me to go down this pathway personally of a low-carbohydrate diet, because I felt like crap on niacin. But niacin blocks the insertion and the collection of cholesterol in VLDL, blocks VLDL. And then there are other medications, resins and other medications, that interfere with bile. Remember, cholesterol is being excreted by the, by the liver cells in the bile and then being reabsorbed in the small intestine, at the bottom of the small intestine, called the enterohepatic recirculation of bile. And cholesterol, bile is a wonderful place to get rid of extra cholesterol. Well, there are certain medications, the uh, ezetimib, which blocks uh, bile reabsorption, bile reuptake, so it allows most of the cholesterol to be pooped out. And that's, those are areas where these different medications are working. So they all work with cholesterol production and with LDL formation, okay? Because the thought was um, that if you look at people who have heart attacks or strokes, the thought used to be, aha, it's because of the fact they're eating. That was the assumption. And fat gets transported in LDL, so the fat that is being transported in LDL must be clogging their blood vessels. But here's the little conundrum. When you look at measures of LDL, LDL being the, the residue of VLDL, so VLDL goes from the liver, transports cholesterol, phospholipids, triglycerides that are manufactured in the liver to the fat cells for storage. And as the, the VLDL dumps its load in the um, fat cells, and then it picks up, it picks up triglycerides and cholesterol, depending on what it's designed to pick up, whether the traffic is fat cells to body or liver to fat cells, mostly cholesterol or mostly triglycerides, big fluffy LDL, triglycerides, um, small dense LDL, mostly cholesterol, but it picks that up. So VLDL dumps its load and picks up a different load, and now it's called LDL. That's how LDL gets formed. IDL, intermediate density lipoprotein, which sheds a few things and then becomes LDL. So LDL is, is a byproduct of VLDL. Be that as it may, when you put pa patients on statins or lipid-lowering drugs, somewhere along the line, the action is to interfere with LDL. Okay? And we know that LDL will dump fat at a site of injury when it responds to macrophages. So you've got platelets, white cells, macrophages, and then it dumps there. And we know that with white cells and getting uh, de-inflaming or quieting down white cell response macrophages, we do see an improvement in clots, but the best improvement is with platelet, uh, with platelet 
decreasing platelet activation. However, the last step, macrophages attract the LDL and LDL gets deposited and you see this residue of fat in the blood vessels. So here's the problem. Intuitively, it makes sense that if you lower the LDL, you're going to have less available. But the body doesn't work that way, folks. Even though you lower the number, you cannot lower the number to zero. You cannot lower the number to zero. And here's the thing about cardiovascular disease. As we proved in the laboratory, number one, fat does not injure the blood vessels. Categorically, absolutely, 100%, there is no proof whatsoever that the infusion of fat or fat in the blood vessels injures the blood supply, injures the endothelium. And LDL does not do that. So the key thing is that irrespective of the concentration of LDL, the concentration of LDL made no difference, made no difference to cardiovascular disease. And if statins were supposed to work, at least by lowering LDL, the higher the LDL concentration, the more effectively statins should work because they do lower LDL number. But no such evidence exists. There's no evidence that the concentration of LDL correlates with cardiovascular disease. And that is because, folks, cardiovascular disease is not a fat or a lipid or an LDL or a cholesterol problem. It's a clotting problem. It's a clot activation. It's an inflammatory problem and a clot activation problem, not a lipid, lipid problem. That's important to understand. So, okay, so statins under those, under those rules absolutely do not work. They provide no benefit whatsoever. However, statins do help in a very, very weak way. And this, folks, so the first uh, diagram of statins is shown in this bottom picture. But the second part, and I've got a whole page on this, is what else do statins do? And statins do have, they absolutely do have, a very weak interruption of the early clotting cascade by affecting certain enzymes. And if you look at this diagram here, which is in my notes, it shows the various places where statins affect and decrease the inflammatory response. And they have a weak anti-inflammatory response. Their anti-inflammatory response is about the same, is about the same as low-dose aspirin therapy. So whether you take an aspirin or a statin, the anti-inflammatory effect, the anticoagulant effect is about the same. And that, folks, is where there's value to a statin, if you consider there to be a value, but it's the same value as a baby aspirin. Now, here's the key thing. If you look at the side effects of aspirins, the major side effect of an aspirin is it prevents blood clots. So it can increase the risk of ulcers of gastritis in the stomach. If you have a bleeding disorder, it can make the bleeding worse. So if you bruise yourself or bump yourself, it will make it a little bit worse. But for the majority of us, we can tolerate an enteric-coated baby aspirin. Enteric-coated means it gets through the stomach without irritating the stomach. We can tolerate that pretty well. And the liver will metabolize that. The kidney will metabolize a little bit. So if you've got kidney disease, it may also be a bit of a question although the other non are more of a concern than the baby aspirin. So absolutely, aspirin does have certain negative side effects that are indications not to use it. When I see a patient with a low-level iron, or they've got H. pylori in their stomach, or they've had ulcers or bleeding, I'm going to say, you know what, let's hold off on the, stat, on, on the aspirin. However, when you look at the, the previous uh, uh, video on this, when you look at statins, they have four major significant side effects. One in 21 people are going to get significant muscle damage. One in 21. One in 204 people, depending on the study, but it's about 7 to 11% of people on a statin, it's going to have a diabetes effect. So they're going to get diabetes or certainly insulin resistance, a direct consequence of statin. When you go on the statin, relative to people that don't, there's a 7 to 11% increase in type 2 diabetes. 
irrespective of the diet it's compared to a control trial and uh, in some of the slides that you'll see in the show notes you can look at those studies i've got those studies quoted so an absolute risk of diabetes number three an absolute risk especially in older people an absolute risk of cognitive impairment and that's significant it is early on reversible over time it might not be but it is an absolute risk of cognitive impairment okay so those are the the uh, three of the major ones the one that is really difficult to calculate but we know absolutely it happens is liver damage liver and upper intestinal damage stomach damage but primarily the liver we know it down that statins damage the liver niacin being one of the worst of them but the statins by themselves do we just haven't got a full quantification on the severity of the damage to the liver because there's so many other effects but if you look at the difference between those people not on statins and those on statins in equal settings there's a significant increase in liver disease, liver damage. So when you look at statins, they have about the same benefit as aspirin, but they have significant major, major side effects. So I'm not saying don't take the statin, but understand the benefit and understand the risk. Your cardiologist and your cardiology PA will not tell you that. That's how you make your decision. Now, those are the medications. What's the single best way, by far, overwhelmingly by far, to fix this problem? Treat your insulin resistance. Treat your insulin resistance. And the most bestest way to do that is with an ultra-low carbohydrate, high-fat diet. Using a ketogenic diet to get yourself into ketosis, where your body is burning fat, not sugar, and your blood sugars are normal, normal blood sugar being about 83, but certainly being regularly below the high 90s, uh, low 100s, you don't have cardiovascular disease. Then you may not need either medication if you achieve insulin resistance, and we measure that in blood work every single day. Every day. A low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet is the single best way to negate cardiovascular disease. Fasting is also a secondary benefit. And I don't like the word fasting. I just mean not eating for long periods of time. Eating maybe two meals a day. But that combination of only eating once or twice a day and not eating carbohydrates is your single best way to mitigate, to minimize, to get rid of, to eradicate cardiovascular risk. Difficult to unwind the damage that's already done, but stabilizing it and reducing that risk is enormous. And if you've got a CAC score of zero and you're on a ketogenic diet, you don't have to take any medication. I would argue that if you've got a significantly positive CAC score, the baby aspirin may still help you to reduce the risk of plaque rupture which is something that may happen on a ketogenic diet because of your history, not because you're present. So for those folks, I would say take that baby aspirin. And then finally, and this is not spoken about even in our own community, but I'm going to tell you this because the data is going to prove this. This is an anecdote, but the data is going to prove this over the next five to 10 years. The ideal combination if you have insulin resistance is to put yourself on an ultra low carbohydrate diet and use, until you become insulin sensitive, a baby aspirin, maybe a statin, but primarily use a drug that is directed to treat insulin resistance, which is a GLP-1 agonist, an Ozempic, a Trulicity, a Manjaro, a Wegovi, any of those drugs, they're all the same, in the same class, but a GLP-1 agonist that treats directly insulin resistance is your single best medication for cardioprotective status. And those studies have not yet been done. We're doing them right now. We're actively engaged in that because we've got a lot of patients on these medications. But the combo therapy of an ultra low carbohydrate diet, the baby aspirin during treatment, and a, uh, um, a GLP-1 agonist is your best treatment for cardiovascular risk. I said so, and I said so first. And I'm, I, I just had to throw that out there. But it doesn't matter who said so first. But think about that, folks.
I am the Carb Addiction Doc. If you want to consult with me, if you want to check out your blood work, if you want to see what the best individualized therapy for you may be, give us a shout. Set up a consultation. 561-517-0642. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Thank you.